that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. So lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Energy Week with George Harvey and the very famous Tom Fennell. Wielding the, the mouse. <laughs> what? Wielding the mouse. Wielding the mouse. <laughs> And uh, we are reporting on energy for a period of more than a week because we recorded the, the show that's usually on Thursday on, um, on uh, a Monday before Thanksgiving. And so we're doing 10 days worth of, worth of energy today. It's still going to be the same length show, though. It's going to be we the just, same length, should yeah. just arrange it a little bit differently. Yeah, we just, we just let a few <laughs> items slide, don't report on them. Every day I get up at, uh, at, well, today I got up a few minutes before four, and uh, I spent about four hours looking at the news of energy for the, for the day, doing searches on the, on the internet. And what I do is I find items that I think are interesting, and since I look at about, I don't know, 300 headlines every day, it's a lot of headlines. I have no idea how Some, many. There have been days that. that have done over 600. I'm sure you do. <clears throat> there are also research. days, yeah, yeah, there are days when, you know, a, a search that usually yields 300 or 250 only yields 20, 70. But, you know, there's a lot of variation. But I think I do about 300 a day. And I find the items out of that that I think are interesting and put together a synopsis of each one that I, that I want to use. And a link to the original, and they go up on the website, which is called geoharvey.wordpress.com. Some and of these are very in-depth and interesting. We don't have the time yeah. to cover them all on this show. Some of these things, the whole show could be around one. Absolutely, and some so, of them are super light. <laughs> <laughs> some of them, if I notice some that are particularly interesting, I'll try to mention them so that yeah. our listeners yeah. can look them up, because some of them are well worth looking up. Right. And so we are going to start, and I don't have the thing in front of me here. There we go. We are going to start with um, uh, November 21st. The, this show is being recorded on the 1st of December. And the first item that we have is from CNN and it has to do with the Dakota Access Pipeline. It says Dakota Access Pipeline clashes turn violent. Turning violent. Now we've got a picture here. We do. I'll, I'll put it up. There we go. The, there it is. The Dakota Access Pipeline protest is turning violent. About 400 protesters ca clashed with police as demonstrators lit cars on fire and police launched tear gas and water at the crowds. They launched, they used water cannons on crowds at sub-freezing sub temperatures. Yeah. That does, that's not nice. No, it's not. They knew what they were doing, too. Police said that the protesters, quote, attempted to flank and attack the law enforcement line from the west, end quote, and described their actions as, quote, very aggressive, end quote. And I want to I note, we don't have it in this week's show, but today, 1st of December, the news came that a group of veterans, led by a man who's a veteran and a police officer, are going to um, the uh, protest area to read that. stand yeah. by the... the 2,000 two vets. 2,000? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <clears throat> and this They're is not fooling around. Now, this, this has the potential of turning into something it, real ugly. It does. The, the fellow who's leading the group is a, is a um, retired police officer. So hopefully, the, you we're going to have police on both sides here, and and you know people who are accustomed to being in uh, uh, situations that are that get tense. So hopefully, we can get these people to to um, behave. Get a little little takeaway here. Yeah. Officers tried to disperse the crowds with water sprayed from hoses attached to fire engines, and also fired rubber bullets and tear gas. Physicians call for the immediate cessation of use of water cannons over concerns of hypothermia in the cold weather conditions. Yeah, yeah. People can die as a result of being oh, they wet. Can. Oh, yeah. You know, this is a <coughs> this is not to be taken lightly. No, it is not. This could escalate into something very serious. It could, and I, as I said, have a hope that it's not going to be that people 
are going to start respecting each other. The police who, who are out there are going, as these veterans arrive, they're going to be facing veterans, and they're going to know it. Yeah. So, so what do you do? They're not a bunch of hippies they're talking about. No, you know, they never were, really. The, the, uh, the Indians who are out there... Anyway, should we move on? Yeah, that was I from think CNN. we should. Uh, this is developing as we speak, really. Yeah. Planetsave.com gave us our next item. Solar and wind versus nuclear. Is baseline power obsolete? This is a very interesting plot. It is very interesting. Renewables covered with efficient, cost-effective energy storage makes the grids virtually obsolete. Utility companies are petrified. They may become irrelevant, and the trillions of dollars invested in building grids throughout the world will no longer produce an income. And, you know, they, when you start looking at microgrids and you start looking at renewable power on, on microgrids with storage, it's becoming clearer and clearer that you can avoid the cost of the transmission lines, and you can avoid the cost of big, big, big um, uh, uh, plants just by, by putting in microgrids and, you know. Well, the model that we lived with so well for over 100 years yes. is over. Yes. And the utilities that <coughs> recognize this will survive, and the utilities that are fighting it are going to die. Um, yeah, I think that's true. Um, I mean, the new utility is going to be concerned with delivering power, not necessarily producing it. I, actually, most utilities do deliver power and not produce it already. Already. Yeah, yeah. it's like 80% of the utilities don't have, have major power production plants. But the paradigm is changing, and that means the business models have to change Absolutely. if these or organizations are going to stay Absolutely. alive. Absolutely. Okay, we are up to Tuesday, November 22nd, and by the way, if you, if you hear a date of a, of, a, of, a, of a news piece that you want to look at, you can go to geoharvey.com and click on the date of the, um, in the calendar in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Our next item is from Clean Technica. This is an interesting one. It's sort of reminiscent of what VW was doing about a year oh. ago. Yeah, and did more than once. And we did more than, I'll, read the, I'll read the headline here. Average gap between official fuel consumption figures and actual fuel use in the EU has hit 42%. This is crazy. <laughs> Research um, uh, re released by the International Council of Clean Transportation shows an average, average discrepancy between official vehicle uh, fuel consumption figures and the actual vehicle fuel use in the e EU has risen to 42%. That means that if you, if you buy a car and it says that it's getting 28 and a half miles per gallon, it's probably getting 20. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, this is, this is crazy. Most well, of what's happening is these guys aren't lying to the authorities. They're cheating. They're, yeah. They're bringing in rigged cars. Yeah. Most of the difference is explain, explained by vehicle manufacturers exploiting loopholes in current regulation. The loopholes allow them to use trick cars. Yeah. Ex exploiting loopholes in French is called cheating. In French. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to remember that. It'll be the first French word I remember aside from we oui and um, non. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next item is from Echo Watch. We have a picture for this of the Indian Point yeah, Nuclear Power Plant. You want to put that picture up? Yeah. No, what a good idea. It. Okay. Here we go. Boy, he's, Joe, I think he's got it. He's got it. There it is. Final nail in Indian Point's coffin? Question mark. Question mark. That's yeah. a... Research, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, in a unanimous decision, the Uni a New York State Court of Appeals Monday upheld a state agency's right to review applications for renewal of federal licenses to operate two Indian Point nuclear power units for another 20 years. This delivers a serious setback to the facility's owner, Mississippi-based Entergy Nuclear. We know about Entergy. Well, the, the, the uh, back story here is that this particular state agency is not in favor of Indian Point. Well, neither is the governor. And neither is the governor and the ex-senator and yeah. uh, a lot of people. A lot of people. And it may have made sense at one time, but I don't think it ever did. I mean, there's 20 million people 
living within 100 miles of well, the There's more than 20 million, I think. This, this plant is 50 miles from the southernmost tip, just a tiny bit more than 50, actually, a couple hundred yards, f from the southernmost tip of Staten Island. That means 50 miles. Yeah, that means almost 100% of the city of New York is within 50 miles of this plant. And most of Long Island, most of West Mon County, yeah, and a lot of New Jersey. A lot of Connecticut. This is, there are a lot of people who live near this plant. And remember, when the Fukushima disaster happened, the Americans in the area were told, stay farther than 50 miles from the plant. Well, this had already been built at that time. Yeah, it had but been. It, but it should have never been built where it was built. Nuclear power plants almost all were built fairly close to large cities. Yeah. Far enough away that the builders felt that they were safe in case of a meltdown, which of course would never happen. You know, in, in 1975, I had two friends who were nuclear engineers, and one of them told me, he said, George, you'll never see a nuclear meltdown. I mean, it's technically possible that, you'll, that a nuclear meltdown will happen during your lifetime. But the wow. plants, the plants... <laughs> wasn't, he, wasn't he right on the money, huh? Yeah. He said these plants have a 1 in 10,000 chance of having a meltdown in any given year. And the guy who was sitting next to him said, uh, we had a meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> and the first guy said, what are you talking about? And the other guy said, well, we had one at... at um, Fermi won. Fermi, yeah. And so the first guy said, well, um, um, and the, the second guy said, and not only that, but it was the second meltdown in the United States uh -huh. because we had one at SRE. Well, you know what? We've had one at Fermi, we've had one at SRE, we've had one at Three Mile Island. Those yeah. are the ones in the United States. We had an explosion at Chernobyl. And that, that's the only one we know of in uh -huh. the Soviet Union. But we had one at Chapel Cross in Scotland, and we had two on two different occasions on Sa at Saint Laurent in France, and we had one at Yoslevska Bohunica in, in Czechoslovakia, and we had uh, three at Fukushima Daiichi. So that's 11 reactors wow. <laughs> have melted down of these very safe reactors. And that's a, a, about a little bit more than 2% of all of the reactors that have ever gone online generating fuel of uh, electricity for the, for the, for the uh, power grid. And I, I would like to ask people, if somebody came to your town and said, we want to build a nuclear power plant here, and there's only a 2% chance that it will ever melt down during its lifetime, how many Here's plants? You say that real fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of course the the projections were wrong because they all left one major component out of the projection, purposely, because uh -huh. they couldn't figure out how important it was, so they just didn't figure it at all, and that well, was that's a good way around. Yeah, the that was human <laughs> failing, and a human failures count, caused in one way or another every one of those meltdowns. I mean, the meltdown at, at Fukushima Daiichi, the reason why it melted down was because of an, a massive uh, earthquake and tsunami. I'm sorry. The tsunami that happened in 2011 was no bigger than the tsunami that happened in 1896. So they knew. They knew. They, they should have known. So they built a six-foot wall when they should have built a 50-foot Well, it was, it was 5.7 meters, so it was 14, 14. feet. 14. No, it was more than that. Sixteen, whatever it was. But you know, they <laughs> should have. It still was inadequate. But you, you know, the reason they chose that that I think was because somebody walked into a room and said, "How tall is the seawall going to be?" And some engineer said, "Well, how much money have we got to spend on it?" Yeah, right. Okay, we should stop talking about this and go on to something else. We're up to November twenty third. Every time I think of Indian Point, when I was a kid, Indian Point was a park. Yeah. And it had a huge swimming pool. Oh. Uh. You, I love going. They up have there. a big swimming pool now. <laughs> uh, Indian Point was a, like like an all day trip. You took a subway downtown. You yeah. walked out to the pier. You got on a, a dayline excursion boat. It took you up there. Oh, it was man. it was it was fun. Indian I Point was a great it. thing. I believe it. Okay, we're up to Wednesday, November twenty third, and oh. unfortunately, this picture that we've got doesn't move. Oh, because the and the the. Uh, on the website, if you go to the website, geoharvey.com, and you click on November 23rd, you'll see this moving picture which shows 
this apparatus being installed, what it is is a tidal well, turbine and it's hanging from a, from a boat in the water. Well, uh, first I'll read the, the headline. Yes. Massive new tidal turbine has been deployed on the coast of Nova Scotia and now produces electricity. It's the first in North America. Yeah, this is from Electric. And I wanted to mention this, this particular website. Yeah. There's a lot of fun. There's a lot of animation. There's on a it. lot of stuff it going on. It shows this yes. thing being built. Uh, yes. You, you could spend a day look, looking you, at that this website. This is interesting it's stuff. Fun. There has been a significant advancement in tidal energy this month with a single massive tidal turbine being deployed on the coast of Nova Scotia in the Cape Sharp Tidal uh, Project. Earlier this month, Open Hydro and Emera. The developers deployed the first in a series of massive turbines. Now they have connected it to the grid. That turbine is big, by the way. It looks like it is is you know six inches across or something. Well, I'm they sorry. said they said that the side wall is uh, 50 feet. Okay. And if the no, I thought I had it here. Five stories high. Five stories. Yeah, not yeah. 50 feet. Five stories. Well, that's high. pretty close. Well, it's close to 50 feet. <coughs> yep. R weighs roughly a thousand tons. Okay. And uh, <coughs> so this is half the weight of a World War II destroyer. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is big. Now, this is an interesting takeaway. I didn't know this. Tidal energy has actually been used in its crudest form for thousands of years. Yes. Ancient Roman and the Middle Ages people contained water in large ponds on a coast. And as the tide went out, it turned water wheels that used mechanical power to mill grain. Yep, they did that. Okay, our next item is from PV Tech. Trump confirms intention to dismantle the clean power plan. Yeah, we're going to hear something immediately following this little thing. Yeah, we about got a couple of things. President-elect Donald Trump has confirmed his intentions to cancel the clean power plan during the election campaign. Trump made several references to his intent to dismantle not only Obama's clean power plan, but also U.S. involvement in the Paris Climate Agreement and solar investment tax credit. And this guy reminds me of King Canute taking his throne <laughs> down to the sea and commanding the tide not to come in. Well, he shot from the hip during his uh, campaign. Yep. And now he's going to be faced with the reality that <laughs> some of these things are just not possible. He's not going to save coal. He, no, he coal, might stop the, He might stop the clean power plan, but it's not going to make much difference. Not at all. Because the utilities are moving away from coal already, and so are a bunch of other people. He made a promise to dismantle the plan, and he made a promise to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. But there's some there's some disagreement among the parties there about whether it's even possible. And one person, or whether it even matters. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what it's going to do? Chinese. Yeah, it, it it matters a lot to the Chinese, Tom, because if we pull out of the clean power plan, they are going to they're be in the catbird seat. They're going to be in the catbird seat. Basically, what happens is of all of the things that have ever happened at the UN, this was one of the ones that had countries rallying behind it most. Is that so? 195 countries have signed on to this plan. Yeah. There are 195 countries in the UN. Okay, same, right. the same 195. No, it's not the same 195. <laughs> a couple countries signed on that are not in the UN. And I, there's a couple of countries in the UN that didn't, didn't sign, sign on. on. All of the OPEC members, except Iraq, signed on. Okay. Iraq just hasn't done it yet. Okay. You know, and you can go down through the list. Democracies have signed this. Socialist states have signed it. Anti-socialist states have signed it. A theocracy has signed it. I mean, it is. Everybody seems to be behind this plan, except for Donald Trump. And since it's already ratified, he's going to have to pull out against international law. And the United States was one of the lead countries going into the plan. So what happens? China says, okay, if the United States pulls out, we'll do it. <laughs> we'll be the leader. And pulling out just makes China the leader in terms of technology, in terms of commerce, in terms of the military, because the military and commerce both depend on this plan, and in terms of moral authority. And the idea that China would have moral authority because the United States is backing f the fossil fuel industry, which is in denial, is appalling. 
Okay. Well, ultimately, it's going to be the marketplace that decides. Yes, as and we will see. where it looks like right now, <coughs> it's going to be talking a different language than it has been. Well, it's going to be Donald Trump talking a different language yeah. than he has been. <laughs> But I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be disappointed by Donald Trump in ways that I have never seen anybody disappointed in a president in my lifetime. And that includes, you name them, yeah. anybody you want. No, it's starting already. I mean, All right. he's, Should he's we already go? been naming some controversial people to advise him. Should we go on to our I next item? I think we should. It the next one's about CNN. Trump, too. Yeah. Trump admits some, connect, some connectivity. <laughs> In quotes, <laughs> between climate change and human activity. Yeah. President-elect Donald Trump has g c conceded that there is some connectivity between human activity and climate change and wavered on whether he would pull the United States out of the international accords. What? <laughs> <laughs> asked if he would. Well, he's previously said that climate change is a hoax invented by the Chinese. That's right. Asked the if he would withdraw the U.S. from international climate change agreements, Trump said he was looking at it very closely. A hoax invented by the Chinese. The, inter, the Intergovernmental um, uh, Panel on Climate Change was, was pushed, and it was the first big international uh, uh, panel on it. It was pushed by two U.S. Pre I'm sorry, two Chinese socialist presidents of the United States. <laughs> George Bush Sr. and Ronald Reagan. Man. There's a takeaway from here. This came from the article. The disaster that Donald Trump represents for the climate cannot be understated. He is yeah. the only head of state in the world who is an out-and-out -out climate denier, and he has the most radical anti-environmental policies of anyone to ever assume the role of presidency. Yeah, compare him with, uh, with Theodore Roosevelt. I wonder what Theodore Roosevelt would do with Donald Trump. <laughs> I think he'd slit his wrist. <laughs> I don't know. Well, the next one is interesting. The this next is a one, good one. It's this all is way up to Thursday. Nas National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, this is Thursday, November 24th, and this came from no a picture here too. Renewable Energy Magazine. You're right, there's a picture. And that, by the way, is, an, is a uh, media picture from Pika Energy, and, and I can tell you about the wind turbine and that thing. That's a nice, that's a nice farm. Isn't that pretty? And in the middle of the picture, there's a wind turbine sticking up whose mast is so narrow you can barely see it against the sky. And at the base of it, a little to the right, is a set of, of, uh, of solar panels. This and is a nice little article, too. Uh, you, you get a look at that particular turbine. Yes. And it's much smaller than we're accustomed to seeing this is a wind turbines. This is a 1.5 kilowatt wind turbine. It's basically enough for one house. Yeah. W with a Not little bit extra power. A little, yeah. And this guy, um, well, let me read the, the thing. What was the title of this? Oh. Did you get U.S. It? government study confirms vast untapped energy and jobs potential for distributed wind power. Right, distributed. And we haven't been talking much about no. distributed wind power. This is wind power in your backyard. Yeah. Um, National Renewable Energy Lab released the first ever technical and economic analysis of the potential of distributed wind power from smaller turbines at home or business sites. The key finding was that distributed wind installed at millions of locations could technically power the entire country. Well, I think one of the things that's happening is there really wasn't much available on the market to do this. The wind turbines that they were building were much, much bigger. The wind turbines that people were using long term were much bigger, but there were always a lot of small turbines around. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, look, you, you picture a, a cowboy movie. Yeah, oh, well, absolutely. There's always one, for, one in one of the farms spinning away. Yeah, spinning away, pumping water. water. Yeah, yeah water but for that cows. particular little turbine, let's put, it, let's put it back up. This comes from a company in Maine, <clears throat> and the interesting story of this turbine is that it was tested for sound. Uh -huh. And when it was tested for sound, they had to find a place to put it where the EPA could test it. And they didn't- The sound was too high. They, didn't have, they <laughs> didn't have a good site, so they actually found a field to put it in that the EPA said, yeah, we can do it there. They found a field. Of course, this is just a little turbine. It's not a big deal to put one of these things up. So they put the, t the turbine up, and the, f the test failed. I'm not saying the turbine failed the test. I'm saying the test failed to, to, to identify the sound of the turbine. 
The sound was being drowned out by the sound of the wind blowing through a field of grass next to it. <laughs> <laughs> that thing is ra rated at, at 38 decibels at 200 feet. <clears throat> well, I hear people saying, oh, my God, you know, these things are 44 decibels and all of that. Meanwhile, they're talking at about 60 decibels. Yes, that's so, it's so <laughs> funny. They have no idea what, what it is. 38 decibels means it's that... It's pretty quiet. It's pretty quiet. At, at uh, 200 feet from this turbine, you might hear it sounding a bit like this. <laughs> this is about how loud it would be. It would, it, it's, it's like a, whisp a person whispering. And when you have that whisper together with the other sounds in an environment you don't hear it <clears throat> because there's a lot of sounds in the environment. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I used to get waked up in the middle of the night by a, by a diesel locomotive and I found where that diesel locomotive was and when it woke me up it was 10 miles away. I, can believe I that, could yeah. see it come into <laughs> to, uh, come into a, a place where where it, where I could see its headlight when it was 7 miles away and I'd hear it running for 15 minutes before that. Interesting takeaway from the article here. Yeah, the small turbines that they're talking about are all made in America. Yes, that's true, and and that um, that picture shows a turbine and solar panels together. And Pi Pika Energy not only provides turbines, but it also provides the electrical. Um, uh, I forget the name of the equipment. Inverters? Well, it's a yeah, it's a special inverter that you can plug things at different voltages into. Oh, okay. So you can get. Um, 12 volts to your computer? No, no, no. You can get uh, solar panels and a wind turbine and, you know, other things all going into the same inverter. Going into the, okay, that you makes see. sense. And then what you get out, what they do is they have that uh, little teeny turbine um, running, I think, I think it's at 480 volts, so that you can position it practically anywhere, you know, you want. It could be a couple hundred yards from your house and and you know, on a mountaintop, for example, and, and the line losses aren't line losses great. are very small. And of course, s sitting on a mountaintop in the middle of no place, you you might have neighbors who could see this, but they'd never notice it because it's so small. Yeah. And they never hear it because it's so yeah. quiet. Anyway, there you go. We are up to uh, still on the 25th of November. Okay. We have a, a piece here from uh, Deutsche Welle. Is that correct? Uh, it's Friday, it is no that. Friday it is November tw got a 25th, coming up too. and it's Deutsche Welle yeah. talking about people's homes. I lived in a house like that once. Did you? <laughs> I have never lived in a house like that. I've lived in a house that was old once. I lived in a house that was built in the 13th century. Okay. Kenya embraces solar to meet energy needs. We've talked this, about... This is true of almost all of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. A lot of India, yep. China. Yep. These people are getting electricity for the first time ever. Absolutely. Nearly 70% of Kenyan population relies on costly and polluting energy sources, usually kerosene. But a green transition is underway as ever more Kenyans turn to solar power to meet their daily energy needs. A small solar system can cost about the same amount as a diesel generator, a small diesel generator, um, and it is as reliable but there is no fuel and there is no pollution. Take away from the article is a quote. The solar pumps the water during the day. You irrigate your farm in the evening. No bills, no charges, absolutely free, God given. No pollution. No, well, they didn't even say that. They didn't say <laughs> it, but it's true. Okay, should we continue? Yeah, let's move on to the okay. next one. Okay. Um, Got another picture here. This yeah, this is an interesting picture. This comes from Echo Generation. Now that's a real picture. That's, that's a, a real, real picture. Real that's place. not a rendering. Pumped hydro, solar, and wind can deliver 100% renewable energy electricity market. Right. Researchers from the Australian National University in, in Canberra say the cost of a 100% renewable energy future is very low. They designed an optimization model for their national electric market using solar, wind, pumped hydro, and high voltage transmission lines. The model said the cost would be $90 per megawatt hour. Now that $90 per megawatt hour is nine cents per, per kilowatt, kilowatt hour. hour. And so it's quite I, competitive. It's quite competitive, but I happen to think they're wrong. Yeah. I think nine cents per kilowatt That's hour is high. high. Uh -huh. Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, wind power in the United States 
they did a, a 2015 wind, uh, wind power, wind technology market report. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the 2015 wind technology market report. Page 62, if you're going to look it up on the PDF <laughs> file, it's actually the 74th page, but it's page 62 um, because there's 12 pages of introductory stuff. It says that uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab did, a, did research on kind of average wind power purchase agreement prices in the Midwest and found that the average price for a power purchase agreement, and this is a levelized cost, so it includes the subsidies was two cents per kilowatt hour. We've seen that. We've seen that come wow. in. Wow. And of course, we've seen solar uh, uh, power purchase agreements at under three cents per kilowatt hour, not in the United States, but elsewhere. Should the, we? This model that they're looking at is interesting. Yes. Because they're, they're playing to the advantages of each. Yes. And this is what they say. We, place, we simply place the solar and PV in sensible zones. You want a wide distribution of PV and wind in order to access many different weather systems. Yes. They balance each other out. Yes. It's raining over here. It's windy over here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Pumped hydro systems can be placed on the tops and bases of hilltops far away from any flowing water. And that, by the way, is what you're seeing there is a pumped hydro uh, reservoir on the top of a mountain. Exactly. Let's which get is that picture up why again. that looks like a um, very strange kind of... <laughs> strangely shaped dam, because it, it is. is. That's exactly what it is. It's a very strangely shaped dam. Yeah. <clears throat> this is old technology. This stuff dates back to the 1920s. In the United States, the 1930s, I think, that that place in Connecticut, was that in the 1930s or the 1920s? Do you remember? You mean down near Dan Danbury? Yeah. Mm, I think it was... The Late Probably 20s? Late 20s. Yeah. yeah. My might have been. Came from that area. This, is, this is old stuff, but yeah. you know, it makes sense. Okay. The Housatonic River. Housatonic River. Yeah. I went to school on the banks of the Housatonic River. Saw it break up. Sounds like a song. Yeah, right. <laughs> I saw that river break up. It had two feet of ice on it. Okay. No and it broke up and it had an ice jam, and we had a flash flood, and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. The river rose over the course of just a couple of minutes to the point where it overflowed its banks. Um, blocks of ice that were perhaps 100 yards long and two feet thick were coming down over the banks of the river and knocking down trees that were two, or two feet or more in di diameter. They were going down like bowling pins. Well, that was exciting. It was exciting. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> it was. It was a memorable event. Okay, should we continue? Yeah, the next one. All we're right. back to Standing Rock. We're back to Standing Rock, and this is Saturday, November 26th from CNN. Standing Rock protesters ordered out by the Army Corps of Engineers. Well, yeah. A new confrontation is brewing over the Dakota Access Pipeline. Protesters fighting pipeline construction must vacate federal property near the Cannonball River um, in North Dakota by December 5th or face arrest. The Army Corps of Engineers said the demonstrators must, uh, a, must evacuate a large campsite where they have been staying. And of course, at this point where this article came out, we still had not seen all those veterans deciding to show up on the site. No, that was just announced like yesterday. Yeah. 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 But they're on their way. They're on their way. <laughs> they're probably they're going to be there before the 5th of December. You can they're bet. They're probably there already. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting event. There, there's stuff going on all over the country <coughs> over this. It's not something that they can just scare a few Native Americans off a piece of property, which, by the way, is not part of the reservation, as far as I understand it. They're, they're camping on federal property. The, yeah, the pipeline is not right. crossing right. the reservation, is, but it is. This is how the uh, Corps of Engineers can kick them out. Yeah, it is. It's not crossing their property, but it is crossing a river upstream from their property. So, so yeah. they want to make sure that their water's good, and they don't have the guarantees, because if that pipeline breaks near that river, they're going to lose their water supply, and there is no replacement. None. So, right. and well, they can truck water in. Good luck with that. Okay. And of course, you got to also realize what's the pipeline there for in the first place? Yes, because the pe oil down to the refinery. Absolutely, and for it's, export. Yeah, and it's it's doubtful. I, in my mind, I think of this, and I should say, that pipeline is is a money pit. 
it's going to it's going to just drain the resources of the people who invest in it because the oil will not flow through it in great enough quantities ever to pay for it. I never saw that one, but that's I haven't scary. seen that it. That doesn't make sense at all. I haven't seen it, but Tom, um, the um, exploration and development of oil wells and gas wells in the worldwide right now is at a level that it was in in the 1950s. And the reason is because the amount of money that they're making, the cost of extracting oil and gas is going up and up and up. Uh -huh. The value of the oil and gas going is down. not going up. Yeah. So, well, it went up a little bit today, but because OPEC said that they were, gonna, they were going to, uh, they were going to uh, uh, control, tighten the control over supplies. But the problem is renewable power is, is competitive with oil at oil's low prices, mm -hmm. which is why the oil and gas companies are losing market share. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons. The, another one is efficiency. So if, they're pr if, they're, if their prices go up, it doesn't mean their profits go up. No. It just means that they're going to be finding it harder and harder to sell their product because it's cheaper to go to somebody else. Well, this I is did, not good I, for I them. I did re read something about <clears throat> this. They have to get this oil to market by sometime in January, or else a lot of the deals that they've made to buy the oil are null and void. They're, they're, by January 2017? Yeah. They're not going to be able to do that. There's no way in creation they could get a pipeline going between now and then. Well, I think a lot of it's been built already. This is only part of the Well, pipeline. this is scary. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, it is. All right. Well, let's Sh move to something a little bit more uh, uplifting. Yes, a little bit more uplifting. Is this the um, WWF Canada blog? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll put you. We'll this is still on there. November 26th. New tool prevents conflict between wildlife and renewable energy. This is an interesting one. By the way, this is not a tool like a hammer or a screwdriver. This is a this software tool. This is a computer tool. program. Yeah, it's a computer program. And it's a good one. WWF Canada has developed a tool to build habitat protection into renewable energy development process so conflicts between wild, with wildlife can be prevented before significant investments are considered. The digital tool helps identify areas where renewable potential is high and conflict with nature is comparatively low. It makes me think of that beautiful little wind turbine that was put up to uh, supply power to the, to the the um, head office of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. In England. In England. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I think it was, it might have been in England. I think it might have been in Scotland. But wherever it was, they, they, did, their, they did their research. They did their homework. They knew that where that wind tur turbine was going to go, they were not having birds nesting yeah. that would fly in the, in, the zone, in the area of its blades. They knew that it could be um, uh, potentially a killer of bats, but only in certain wind speeds at certain times of day. So they shut the turbine. So they shut the turbine down, down if it's if it's Makes sense. within <laughs> half an hour <laughs> of sunrise sense. or sunset, and the and the uh, the uh, wind speeds are the right uh, speeds to get bats up near where the blades are. So okay. there are there are solutions to these problems. Oh yeah, absolutely. We're up to Sunday, November twenty seventh. Oh, I'm getting <coughs> hungry already. Let me you are? This, let me get this picture up. Ah, this is from The Wire, the picture. Let's get the picture. There it is. There we go. Yeah, by golly. Is in your mouth drooling already? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I want to go home and eat. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting headline here. What's the carbon footprint of your sofa? Yeah, of your or sofa. Or of your festive meal? Yes. Recently, researchers from Carnegie Mellon University calculated the carbon footprint of Thanksgiving dinners, the, the footprint they had every year on November 24th, and, and published their findings um, on different states in the U.S. And th this, this was something I found really interesting. The meal footprint is lowest in Vermont. Yeah, that's at, interesting. At nine hundredths of a kilogram, which is 90 grams, right? 90 grams of carbon dioxide for a Thanksgiving meal and the highest in West Virginia, where it's 3,000 uh, uh, grams. That's quite a difference. That's a huge difference. In West Virginia, it's different. 
they're burning coal and and uh, and you know I don't know maybe <laughs> okay. they're they're putting carbon dioxide you know dry ice cubes in their water to have some <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a quick uh, takeaway here yeah in a time like this we must consider our own individual contribution to the world's carbon footprint that's right that's basically the message from this article that's right yep so um, we're actually getting a little bit low on time here, Tom. Very low on time, I'm, I have to say. Well, we're up to Monday, so. We're up to Monday. We'll go through okay. this one real quick. All right. climate change to be taught in all United Arab Emirates schools. Um, this is not actually Monday. This is still Sunday. I this, is su this is the last one for Sunday. Last one for Sunday. Awareness of climate change and how to help sustain the environment will soon be taught in classrooms across the UAE. Authorities announced curricula may include um, learning about sustainability, and school children will be sh uh, shown how to take energy saving measures. The program will include all children of all ages. This is from gulfnews.com. Okay. And our next item is. Next the item is on picture. Monday. Um, and we got a picture this for is this from one Digital too. Journal, and that lake is Lake Hartwell near Anderson, South Carolina. And it's part of the drought. It's is this the article that has the pictures of the... Uh, there's two articles on this drought. There's one of them has got an article that's got the picture of the south. Yes. And showing where the drought yeah, is. Yeah, a map. And it's pretty serious. It's serious. Okay, what do you have for a t title? Once for in a generation drought may become the new norm yeah, for the southeast. Yeah, wa water isn't a commodity that most southeasterners usually worry about, but lately the drought has become a hot topic as more and more communities begin dealing with declining water resources. The drought, already exceptionally severe, continues to deepen. Even worse, these conditions may become the new normal. This article has, <coughs> has some NASA satellite imagery of the wildfires oh, yeah. that are happening in southeastern U.S. Yeah. And if you that's happen, scary. Yeah, if you happen to live in a red state, that's what climate change looks like. <laughs> if Donald Trump says it doesn't exist, you can show him the picture. <laughs> He won't. I shouldn't be laughing because well, it's not he's, a laughing he's, matter. You know, I think he's, he's deluded, but that's okay. All right, and we are at the okay. South China Morning Post. Let me, let me. This is... Let me try to get us up again. Yeah, here. okay. Okay, estimated cleanup cost for Fukushima nuclear disaster is nearly doubled. We haven't seen the end of this. No, we haven't. Every time they turn around, it's higher. Yep. Japan's Ministry of Economic, uh, Economy, Trades, and Industry now expects the total cost of dealing with the aftermath of the Fukushima disaster to total more than 20 trillion yen, which is $178.8 billion, nearly double the previous estimate. Sources familiar with the matter said the previous estimate was 11 trillion yen, $178 billion, because somebody didn't want to spend money on a, on a seawall. And one of the takeaways here is you got to read between the lines. They're running out of money. Yeah. And they're going to start charging their customers for their mistake. Yes, that's what they're going to do. Wow. <laughs> that is what they're going to do. Now we're up to CNN well, on a Tuesday, good, this is a good picture. November 29th. Yeah, let me get this picture up if I can. And I made a mistake on this picture. I took a, I took the picture with the article. I should have gone to the federal government site and... Actually, it's the University of Nebraska site on drought. But it would have shown the entire map. Got the bigger map. picture. Got the picture for the whole. Well, from what you nation. just from what you can see here, it's pretty scary. This is terrible. Terrible. This Northern is Georgia, terrible. Northern Alabama, Western the, Virginia. Right. The red area there is is extreme drought. The dark red area that's darker than red is called exceptional. It is worse than extreme drought, and the area of that exceptional and extreme drought is bigger than the drought that we've been hearing about for years in California. In California. Yep. That this drought in the southeast, which by the way is in agricultural land that is produces red voters is now and ha, which in many places has red soil is now producing red crops because they can't grow. So there it is Donald Trump, there's climate change. You may not think it's real, but if you don't want to do anything about it, you're going to have to face some voters who don't like this, it. This is a, 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 it's a good takeaway. Yeah. As global temperatures warm, this is what a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. There's a shift in day-to-day -day weather events. There's a difference between weather and climate. 
Yes. Okay. But the, the warmer global temperatures will cause an increase in droughts and heavy rains. Yes. Global warming doesn't mean people around the world will no longer receive cold weather and snow. Yes. What is certain is warmer, even record-breaking global temperatures will cause an increase in droughts and heavy rains all across the world. Right. So they're going to have a drought here, heavy rains there. They're not even going to be in the same spot. Yeah. Well, look at that picture of uh, uh, the picture map and, and the coast areas that well, the are, coast got a hurricane the coast got a hurricane just a couple of weeks ago you know and if that hurricane had they had hit, a lot of rain in they hurricane. had a huge amount of rain they have a situation where they've got a terrible drought going on and a few miles away they've got f serious Record flooding rain flooding yeah and how do you reconcile that well this is this is the kind of thing that we can expect more we can and more expect often. more and more of yeah okay um our next item is from Green Tech Lead. This is still Tuesday, November 29th. Renewables upset market for boilers, turbines, and generators. <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> Man. It's a second order consequence that you don't normally think of. The global market for boilers, turbines, and generators is set to decline thanks to growing focus on renewable energy resources and awareness about environmental issues, according to a study from Global Data. The market is expected de to decrease from 318 billion for the first full period of 2010 to 2015 to 241 billion for 2016 to 2020. Now I want that's to point out drop. that's about a 25% yeah. drop. That if we had a if we had a had a had a uh, recession or a depression in which 25% <clears throat> of the people were laid off, we'd have a very serious problem. I mean, I, I don't. Think so. This would be as bad as the Great Depression, and that's what's hitting this, these businesses. And of course, and, and they, these businesses are local. Yeah, these are many of famous, them are. These, you, you don't you don't buy a, a boiler from China. Actually, it depends on the boiler. I mean, one of the, the big, big ones. Yeah, the, um, uh, Chicago Bridge and Steel is one of the Bridge and Iron. Bridge and Iron. Yeah. Chicago Bridge and yeah. Iron. Is one of the big companies, and they sell boilers all over the world. All over the world, yeah. yeah nuclear reactors too, but um, yeah, a lot of the boilers are, are local. Boiler making is a well, you know what a boiler maker is. You get them at every <laughs> bar. <laughs> what can I say? My uncle Charlie, I, I saw my uncle Charlie have two boiler makers for breakfast. <laughs> I am not kidding. Hey, I I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Okay. Are we off of that and on to the next one? Yeah, week? we're... This is WWLTV.com. This is uh, from New Orleans. Yes. Parts of the New Orleans metropolitan area could disappear in 20 years this from is, global warming. You know, Donald Trump, do you want to go to... New <laughs> tell you what, actually, Donald Trump owns oceanfront property in Florida. What do you suppose is going to happen there? It's going to get wet. It's going to get wet. <laughs> the National Academy of Sciences released a study which said New Orleans could see its one point, uh, nearly 14.5 uh, inches of sea level rise by 2040 and 6.5 feet by 2100. The scientists believe that metro areas outside New Orleans' protective levee system may have to relocate because of rising sea levels because within within the next two decades. Yeah, this, is, this is like around the corner. <laughs> if it's going to happen in the next two decades, it's happening already. And you know what? It's happening already. There are communities... Well, Miami Beach is, is having <clears throat> uh, floods on sunny days. Floods on sunny days uh, every time the new moon comes. <laughs> and there are communities in Louisiana already that are being relocated because they are falling into their, their ocean level rise. Swamps. And I was talking with somebody yesterday who said, you know, he said he, li he lives in a house which is very near Long Island Sound. And he said there's a creek that runs through, through the property that it's on, which is getting backed up at high tide. And uh -huh. it never used to get backed up at high tide. And he came to the conclusion based on his experience, which is anecdotal experience, but nevertheless, there it is, he says he thinks that the numbers that we're getting from the scientists are old because the, the conditions are worse than conditions they, they're are worse saying. Thing. Yeah. So we're up to Wednesday, November 30th. Well, I just wanted a, a, a quick 
I want to read something about this real quick. Okay, go ahead. Three feet of sea level rise in Miami is Venice, and New Orleans is gone. Yep. Three feet. These numbers mean the wetlands, salt marshes, and coastline would move further inland, and whole metropolitan areas could be gone. Yeah. In light of the presidential election, the Ocean Conservancy is nervous. Yes, well, so is the insurance companies. Yeah, and so is the insurance companies. Although the insurance companies have got a big advantage here, which Donald Trump may find out about soon, and that is they can say, oh, we don't want to pay on this place. We're just going to tell you that you can't have a policy anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's got a, he's got a, a, a resort on the ocean in, in Florida. Yeah. What happens if he can't get insurance on it? He Donald doesn't Trump. have a resort anymore. Oh, he could have a resort until <laughs> he's got a, a bad, resort. bad storm, and then yeah. and then that's the end of it. Yeah. He's not going to be able to sell it. No. And that's happening now. I mean, a large number, <clears throat> I should say a large number, but numbers of shorefront mansions are unsaleable now. Yes. Because they can't get flood insurance. Yes. Okay, we are up to November 30th. And this is the this last is day of the week, isn't climate it? Climate home. Well, it's the last day of 10 days. Oh, are we? Yeah. Oh, yeah are we? Brand new Dutch coal plants are crashing in value. Now this I got a, is, this is absolutely crazy. Here. Yes, there's the picture. And let's get the picture up. Let's get the picture up. This is a uh, Dutch. That, that's an actual place. That's a real honest to goodness location. Is that the one this, uh, this article is about? Uh, yeah, I believe it is. Three Dutch coal plants opened in 2015, hey, that's only last year, are already threatened with early closure? Their owners failed to foresee a rapid rise in renewable power generation, falling demand, and calls to phase out coal. It was a costly error that other countries could learn from, but the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis says, and you know, if Donald Trump learns from this one, then he's going to fire the person he wants to install for the APA manager. And if he it's doesn't be want to learn from this, he's going to be in trouble. Well, there's a takeaway here. Regardless of if or when these plants are retired, the mere prospect of their closing just a year after opening is a vivid demonstration of the extreme risk in building a coal-fired power plant today. Yeah, and you know what? It's not just coal, it's oil too, and gas. Oh yeah. This is why I'm saying I don't think that that pipeline in the Dakotas is ever really going to carry appreciable amounts of, of, uh, of oil, because I, I, I don't... The I market's don't, not going to support it. The mar market is not going to support it, I don't think. Okay. And well, this, I think, is the last item. The, the one coming up. Yeah. Green Wind Tech Media. Wind surges to nearly 15% of Texas power supply. Now this is Texas. This is Texas. Okay, this is an oil producing company. This is, state yes. That produces a lot of its power still by coal. Uh, a lot of it from coal and, and historically it has been the center of oil and gas in the United States. Absolutely. Yes. But it's also got a lot of wind. It's got a lot of wind. Texas grid operator ERCOT announced a new record for wind on Monday as wind provided more than 15,000 megawatts to the state. It is not the hour-by-hour hour records that are impressive, however. Wind power will provide at least 14.7% of the state's electricity in 2016, according to ERCOT. This is up from 11.7 in 2015. So it went from 11.7 to 14.7. That's a big increase in one year. It is that. Texas is also not known for a lot of solar but the solar is starting to come online. Texas is the, is the home of Encore, a utility which has got that wind, uh, uh, wind power plan that a person can have. Yeah, yeah, they're getting free energy at They get night. free electricity from <laughs> 9 p.m. until 6 a.m. That's amazing. Any amount they want. That's amazing. This is like Vermont's cow power. By the way, cow power doesn't come from cows. It doesn't? No, not all of it. I mean, some of it might, okay. but most of it comes from wind and solar. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a, a subscriber, aren't I, you? I subscribed to Cow yeah. Power the moment I heard about it. And yeah. So it was, it was not uh, Green Mountain Power, it was, it was CVPS before okay. Green yep. Mountain yep. Power yep. bought them out. And, um, and in London, they're making power from coffee grounds. 
They're, they, you know, <laughs> they're making power from all kinds of things. Things that, that would have gone to a landfill are being used to make power. Makes my, sense to me. I've, I've mentioned this many times. My son, Jeff, um, lives in Kenosha, and he works for a company called Centresis that makes big um, uh, centrifuges. These are big. These uh, One centrifuge, this you want to like move for, it? This uh, <clears throat> sewage treatment. Right. You, there's one centrifuge, you want to move that one centrifuge, it's going to occupy the entire back end of a, of a, of a tractor trailer. Okay. And um, th when they get these things going, they go really fast, you know, and, the, and the, the armature inside is very heavy. So if you have a, if you have a centrifuge and you, you shut it off, there's no it's, break. It's still going And it'll take hours to come <laughs> to a stop. Yeah. And um, the, the, uh, the thing that they did in Kenosha, usually he goes all over the world. He goes to China, he goes to Brazil to install these centrifuges. But they installed one just down the street from where he lived. Uh -huh. They in installed two of them, in fact. And this was a sewage treatment plant in Kenosha. What they had been doing was they had been taking the sewage and treating it, separating the water, filtering it, putting it into Lake Michigan, and then taking the, the sewage that they had treated to a to a uh, to a, um, uh, a landfill. Landfill. Yeah. Now what they do is they have it come in. It goes through a centrifuge. That just brings it to the right uh, amount of, of liquid in it so that it can go into a biodigester where it's digested. That produces methane, which is used to make electricity <coughs> and heat for the plant. <coughs> then it goes into a thing called a Pondus reactor where, where it's all heated up to a fairly high temperature and treated with an acid. This releases more stuff that bacteria can run off of. It goes into a second uh, uh, biodigester. This produces about 35% more methane than if you just use one. The, that methane is, is, um, is also used for heating and, and mm -hmm. electricity. Then the material from that goes through another uh, centrifuge, is taken down to about 8, eight or 9 percent um, um, liquid between the centrifuge and the final drying at 190 degrees Fahrenheit. So that, and then it's put into, into bricks. And those bricks, which had been human waste, are now, according to the EPA, Class A fertilizer, you can grow carrots in them. <laughs> okay, this makes a lot of sense. I and mean, we should have been doing this forever. You've got a, you've we got a sewage treatment. Out. Yeah, you've got a sewage treatment plant that was costing millions of dollars to run for 100,000 people, and all of a sudden it's making money. Yeah. What? <laughs> but the Republicans don't want that. What? <laughs> well, the reason is because Donald Trump is not a fiscal conservative. He says, you, you don't have to worry about default, you print your own money. Yeah, right. And Republicans who have been fiscal, fiscal conservatives back that. No, I'm sorry. It doesn't make the sense. The world has been stood on its head. Things don't make sense. People need to rethink their positions. And renewable power? It's well, crazy. you know, in nature. Nothing gets lost. Nothing. There's no waste in Asia. Something eats everything, except, even rocks. Except the stuff that falls at the bottom of the pond gets covered over by dirt and winds up being made into coal. And even that gets used by somebody who digs it out of the ground and burns <laughs> it. <laughs> Nothing gets wasted. You know, Nothing in the should long be wasted. Run. And in the years ahead, they're going to look back in here and say, my God, you know, they used to throw stuff out. <laughs> they, and they're already doing it. And if you, if you don't believe this is true, ladies and gentlemen, consider this. Do you own a piece of gold? Yeah. Where did the gold come from? Where did the gold come from? Yeah. Where is gold made in nature? Helium is made out of hydrogen and stars. Yeah. Where is gold made? I don't know. Gold is a product of the destruction of novas. Is it really? Yeah. Well, be darned. Nothing gets lost. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. Well, I think we're out of time here, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, we are. See you next we got, time. We've got 49 seconds left. <laughs> no, we don't. We started a minute early. <laughs> we got a different class. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> see you next time.